what, what do you suppose temptation looks like? Athanasius painted a vivid picture of temptation in the life of Anthony. Athanasius was a, a bishop in the fourth century in Alexandria in Egypt. He was a theologian. And Anthony was a monk who died in the middle of the fourth century. Being a monk, Anthony had been the kind of person who went out into the wilderness alone to engage in spiritual warfare and to seek God. He'd give up everything that living in town would offer and go into the wilderness to live an ascetic life. And when he died, people wanted to know what his life had been like. And so Athanasius wrote the life of Anthony and it became an instant classic. And in the life of Anthony, Athanasius described what temptation looked like for Anthony. Anthony grew up in a privileged home as a Christian and so to go into the monastic life, he had to leave all of that behind. And when he announced his intention to leave all of that behind, he said voices from, from Satan, voices of evil, began speaking to him immediately, trying to convince him that he shouldn't leave behind everything. He said that Satan even appeared to him in the form of a woman trying to lure him back to an old life and to the pleasures of the flesh. And he had to say no to the voice and to the vision. Later, he did leave town and he asked a friend to do a strange thing, to close him inside of a tomb. It's an odd thing to do, but inside that tomb, Antony faced temptation and the devil. One night, the devil, he said, felt like he was actually physically beating Antony. And another night, he said that demons were attacking to the point that the tomb, the walls of the tomb were shaking. And he said he saw visions of animals, demons appearing to him as animals and, and not as puppies. Nothing cuddly about these visions. They were lions and snakes and violent creatures. And he said, when he saw this vision, that is the time at which he confessed his faith in the living God. And he said, when he did, God spoke and the, and the demons were gone. And so that's one picture of what it looks like to face temptation. It may be a strange picture. It may not be a familiar picture to you to say, okay, that's what temptation looks like. But then again, hearing evil pulling us to do something, that sounds familiar. Being tempted to do something we know we should not, that sounds familiar. Feeling our worlds being rocked by evil, well, that feels familiar. And being threatened, feeling threatened by evil, that feels familiar. Why? Because temptation is familiar. We all face temptation. Temptation is something that happens to all of us. We feel the lure, the enticement to do evil. We feel the pull to think evil thoughts to say evil words, to do evil deeds. We have all been tempted. It's shocking to find that not only are we all tempted, but we deal with temptation differently at different points in our lives. Sometimes we're victorious over temptation. Sometimes we're really struggling with temptation. Sometimes we've fallen to temptation. Where are you experiencing temptation today? What does it look like for you? Discouragement? Lust? Envy? Pride? Greed? Sloth? How are you dealing with temptation right now? What is temptation, actually? Temptation is the enticement to do evil. Now, look at what temptation's not. Temptation is not sin. Sin is doing evil. Sin is giving in to temptation. Temptation is the enticement to do evil. And it may shock you to know, to realize, to understand that Jesus experienced temptation. In our scripture reading today, we read that Jesus went out into the wilderness, and in the wilderness, he faced Satan. He faced temptation. In his ministry, he faced demons. Jesus faced temptation. 
And so we want to ask the question today, how can what happened to Jesus, how can the way that Jesus faced temptation help us to face temptation more successfully? Because that's what we want. We don't want to be we, we don't want to be knocked over by temptation. We don't want to give in to temptation. We want to stand more successfully against temptation. And so we look to Jesus and, and we ask Jesus, how? How do we do this? As we dig into our scripture reading today, we find, first of all, that Jesus faced Satan. Jesus faced Satan in Mark chapter 1, verses 12 and 13, where we read, the Spirit immediately drove Jesus out into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness 40 days, being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild animals, and the angels were ministering to him. Now, it's interesting to find that the Spirit drove Jesus into the wilderness. Jesus had just been baptized by John the Baptist. He had seen heaven torn open, and he'd been filled with God the Holy Spirit. And then God the Holy Spirit immediately turned around and drove Jesus out to face Satan, which is important because it means that Jesus didn't just happen to engage in this experience. Jesus didn't come upon it accidentally. No, God planned for this. God intended for God the Son to face Satan. The Spirit of God drove Jesus out into the wilderness. And the wilderness here is a fascinating place because here the wilderness symbolizes all of those places where we don't have what we need. We are out beyond civilization and it's a place of deprivation. We don't have the basic things that we need in life. Not only is it a place of deprivation, but we discover that the, the wilderness is a place of danger as well. Jesus faced wild animals. And again, these are not cuddly animals. These are dangerous animals like lions, again, and, and wolves, violent creatures that threatened Jesus. But beyond deprivation and danger, Jesus is facing the devil. He was in the wilderness for 40 days and faced Satan. And so that's what the wilderness is here. But it's interesting because as we look at the wilderness in the Bible, we find that there's two different ways to look at wilderness. Here we find wilderness that that is danger and deprivation and the devil, but Frequently, we find that wilderness is the desolate place, and we find Jesus going to the desolate, to the lonely places, to be alone, to pray, to connect with God, and to rest. Two visions of what the wilderness means. But it's built on two visions even of what the world is and the world means, because in some ways, the world is the place that God created It's the place of God's goodness. It's the place where God gives us good gifts and we see that God is being good to us. In some ways, that's what the world means. But the world also in the Bible means the place that is in open rebellion against God. The world is the place that is actively fighting with God. We have two visions of wilderness, two visions of world, and and they're trying to show us that we experience around us two realms two realms. Now, when I say two realms, what do I mean? Well, Christian begins to understand this in the Pilgrim's Progress as he faces the demon Apollyon. The Pilgrim's Progress was written in the 17th century by John Bunyan, and the main character in it, his name is Christian. It's an allegory. We got it like a two by four to the forehead, right? This is Christian. He's on his way from the city of destruction to the celestial city. He's on a journey along a road. And on Christian's journey from the city of destruction to the celestial city, he comes across a demon named Apollyon. Bunyan writes a lurid description of Apollyon. He says that he was clothed with scales like fish. He had wings like a dragon, feet like a bear, and out of his belly came fire and smoke, and his mouth was as the mouth of a lion. Pretty, right? Nice. The kind of guy you'd like to run into in the parking lot on the way out, right? Apollyon is threatening, and Apollyon says to Christian, where are you from? He says, "I'm I'm from the city of destruction. I was born there. And Apollyon says, oh good, I, 
I know you, you are, you are one of mine. The city of destruction is in my realm. You were born in my city, in my realm. You're one of mine. You belong to me. And, a, and Christian says, no, I saw what it was like to belong to you. And I chose instead to declare my loyalty to the king of princes and to his celestial city. And Apollyon said, you don't, you don't get to do that. You don't get to choose. You're from here or you're from there, but you don't get to choose. You were born mine. If you'll leave aside that king of princes and come back to me, we'll forget that this ever happened. And Christian says, I, I will never belong to you and to your realm again. And that's when Apollyon attacks Christian. There's two realms, two visions of wilderness, two visions of world, two realms. And this is important for us to understand because we are surrounded by a spiritual battle between the kingdom of God and the kingdoms of this world. Those are the two realms. The two realms are the kingdom of God and the kingdoms of this world. Those two realms are different from one another. God runs the kingdom of God and Satan runs the kingdoms of this world. And you can belong to one or the other, but not to both of them. And the kingdom of God and the kingdoms of this world are at war with one another. And I say this to you not to scare you or not to cause you to see demonic forces and spiritual realities behind absolutely everything that happens in life, but I say it to you to let you know there are two realms, the kingdom of God, the kingdoms of this world. You can belong to one or the other, not to both. The two are at war with one another. And that's what we see in the temptation of Jesus. We see the clash of these two realms. There's a spiritual battle going on around us, a spiritual world around us. Are you aware? Do you see? Do you, do you sense and understand that there is a spiritual realm and a spiritual battle going on around us? Or are you wandering through life thinking that it's just not real? Jesus faced Satan. Then we find Jesus faced evil and won. In the verses between verse 13 and verse 21 where we pick up again, Jesus began his public ministry, announced the kingdom of God being at hand, called people to repent and believe the good news. He began calling disciples, Simon and Andrew, James and John. And having done that, he went to his adopted new hometown of Capernaum. And in Capernaum, he went into the synagogue and one Sabbath he was teaching. And in the synagogue, we find that Jesus faced evil again, verses 23 and 24 continue. And immediately there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Now there's three things that I want you to see about this passage. But the first thing that I want you to see is that when Jesus, the Son of God, walked into the synagogue, immediately this demon made itself known. Immediately is one of Mark's favorite words, but what we're seeing here is that in the presence of the Son of God, evil makes itself known. In the presence of good, evil makes itself known. But the second thing that I want you to see is that the man with the unclean spirit was already in the synagogue. It's not like the unclean spirit jumped into a man in the synagogue at the last minute. The spirit was in the man, the man was in the synagogue, and no one knew. And it's just a reminder to us that evil lurks in places that we don't expect it to be lurking. Sometimes it comes out in the most unexpected of places. But then I want you to see as well that this spirit is the only person in the room who fundamentally understands who Jesus is. The people in the synagogue have no idea who he is. Even his disciples yet have no idea who he is. But the unclean spirit, the demon says, I know who you are, Jesus of Nazareth. You're the Holy One of God. And he knows that there is no comparability between the two of them, that Jesus has the upper hand in power. And he knows that Jesus at one point will destroy the demon and all of its hosts along with it. And, and he asks, is this the day? Are you coming today? And are you going to destroy all of us today? Yes or no? 
And then as we go on into verses 25 and 26, we find Jesus winning this contest with this unclean spirit. Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit, saying, be silent and come out of him that is the man. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying out with a loud voice, came out of him. So what I want you to see here is that Jesus recognized that the unclean spirit in using all these words was trying to control the situation and even see if it could control Jesus and Jesus was having none of it. Be silent, he said, and the demon had to be silent. And then Jesus commanded the demon to come out of the man and and the demon had no choice. It had to obey the voice of the Son of God because the Son of God always wins. And then as the demon came out of the man, I want you to notice that that he convulsed the man and the man was crying out. And this is important to see because one of the basis of temptation in our life is that evil presents it to us, to ourselves as good. Evil comes to us and says, this is gonna be fun. This is freedom. This is gonna be for your good. Engage in this and you're gonna love it. But what we see here is the result of evil taking root in our lives. It it grabs hold of us and it does great damage to us and leaving it convulses us and causes us to cry out in pain. That's the very nature of evil. Jesus won, hands down, with no contest against this demon. And that's important to see because we wonder at times if evil doesn't win. We, we worry at times that evil looks like it, it, it's going to win. E- evil wins battles from time to time. People do evil things. And, and those evil things do damage to us. The, the evil things that, that we see happening, we wonder, is that, gonna, is that gonna take root in the world? Is the world gonna go altogether evil? Is evil going to win? People do evil and seem to prosper. And that leaves us confused. We see people even very close to us at times making evil choices, friends making evil choices, family members making evil choices. And we wonder, is evil going to win? We look at evil being done and we see all the great damage that's done as a result to us, to the people we love, to to the community, to our country, to our world, and we wonder, is evil going to win? We worry that evil might just win. But we find here an important principle and that is that we are on the winning side of the war. You see, evil may win battles, And that may cause us to worry at times, but we see here that while evil may win a battle, God is winning the war. As we look even at the cross of Jesus, we see Jesus hanging on the cross, dying, and we wonder, has evil won? Evil had to think that the victory was being won, but even as Jesus is dying on the cross, we recognize this may look like a battle that evil is winning, but God is winning the war because three days Days later, God issues his definitive no to evil, and Jesus is risen from the dead, victorious. He's victorious over death, over sin. He's, he's victorious over evil, over Satan, over temptation. Jesus is victorious over all of it. And now all of the rest of history, living in light of the cross and the resurrection, is just God's mopping up operation in the war. The decisive battle is won. The victory is God's. The victory belongs to Jesus Christ, and evil's days are numbered. Evil may win battles, but God wins the war. And we belong to God. We're on the winning side, even though we worry along the way. Beyond that, facing Satan and embodied evil, Jesus faced temptation and won. C.S. Lewis in the Screwtape Letters paints a very different vision of what temptation looks like, different vision than Athanasius did or John Bunyan did. Those were personified evils, very, very scary types of evil. In the screw tape letters, C.S. Lewis, the great theologian, author, and philosopher of the 20th century, described 
a senior demon and a junior demon. The senior demon was writing letters of advice to the junior demon, almost like a boss in a company, a, a, an executive in a company mentoring a young executive in a large corporation. The senior demon's name is Screwtape, and he's writing to this junior demon named Wormwood, who also happens to be his nephew. And he's trying to advise Wormwood on how to tempt human beings. Wormwood had a, a client, a human being they called the patient. The patient was a 30-year-old man who had recently become a Christ follower. And Screwtape wanted Wormwood to lure the patient back to their side. And he said, yeah, well, here's how you do it. Try this. The patient just moved in with his elderly mother to take care of her. Make him resent taking care of his mother. When that didn't work, World War II broke out, and the young man was not immediately called to active duty, and in sorting that out, Screwtape told Wormwood, make him think he's a hypocrite. When that didn't cause the young man to fall, Screwtape said, put women in front of him. He likes women. He, he won't be able to stand against the temptation of lust. And when that didn't work and his World War II was heating up, Screwtape put forth one of his I think most subtle temptations. He said, make him, make the patient an extremist. And Lewis wrote, whichever he adopts, this is from screw tape to Wormwood, your main task will be the same. Let him begin by treating it as, as a part of his religion. Then let him, under the influence of the partisan spirit, come to regard it as the most important part. What a subtle temptation, right? To take something good and put it in a place that belongs to only God. Lewis reminds us that temptation can be very subtle. But as we look at what C.S. Lewis wrote about temptation, we finally begin to see evil for what it truly is and for what it truly does. Evil seeks to harm us and to separate us from God. If you're not yet a disciple of Jesus, temptation seeks to cause you to sin and feel guilt and feel shame as a result of your gift and in your shame to tell yourself that you are so bad that God could never love you and accept you. Temptation wants to separate you from God forever. If you're a disciple of Jesus, evil seeks to tempt you to sin in order that you might harm your relationship with God. Because every time we give in to temptation, every time we sin, every time we do evil, we do harm we do harm to our relationship with God, and that's what evil wants. We do harm to our relationships with one another. That's, that's the nature of sin and of evil. We harm our relationships with one another. And temptation wants us to sin to do evil because when we do evil, it's like we put poison into the world, and the poison that we put into the world damages absolutely everything everything. And we have to be real about what temptation is really wanting us to do. It wants to harm us and separate us from God, from one another, and damage our world. First Peter chapter 5 verse 8 ends with a very clear picture. Peter writes, your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. That's the true nature of temptation. That's the true nature of evil. That's the goal of temptation and evil. But having seen what temptation truly is, what evil truly is, we have to remind ourselves of a word that resonates throughout our scripture reading today, and it's applied to Jesus. And the word that resonates throughout the passage today is the word authority. Authority. 
The word authority in the original language means not only an authorization, but power to do something. And we see Jesus operating in power and authority. He teaches with authority. He casts out demons with power. He heals disease with power. He has power and the authorization to use it. Jesus is the Son of God in flesh. He is filled with power. But at his baptism, he is then filled with God the Holy Spirit who is now with him, operating in the power of God the Holy Spirit. And he receives the blessing at his baptism of God the Father. That's my son with whom I am well pleased. He has authorization. Jesus has been commissioned by the Godhead, Father, Son, and Spirit to come to earth to proclaim the good news that the kingdom of God is at hand. But Jesus has not only the power and the authorization to proclaim this good news, but he's here to advance the kingdom of God. He is here to engage in warfare with the kingdoms of this world. He is here to claim territory that the kingdoms of this world have unrightly claimed for themselves. And he is here to claim back for God people that the kingdoms of this world have tried to take away. Jesus has power and authority. And this is important to us because it means that we do not face temptation that we can't defeat without God's help. Jesus has power and authority, he has defeated temptation, and he now helps us to stand against temptation as well. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13 says, no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. So what is this saying? It's saying that some of the help that God offers us is anytime we face temptation, God is going to give us an out from it. He's going to give us a way to escape. But there's more help with temptation. The Bible says that God provides us with armor. We face a spiritual struggle, a temptation coming to us from the spiritual realm. He says, I give you spiritual armor to stand in that spiritual warfare. In Ephesians chapter six, verses 14 through 17, we read, stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Now, he uses the language of armor, but look at the spiritual realities that it represents. Truth, faith, peace, righteousness, salvation, Spirit of God, word of God the spiritual weapons that we need in order to stand against temptation. So when we come to temptation, we come with God's help. So that leaves a call on us, on me, on you. Face temptation resolutely. Face temptation resolutely, determined to stand. Face temptation resolutely with Jesus. God gives us his help, but then the question becomes, what then do we do? God is giving us the help. He's giving us a way out. He's giving us spiritual protection. He's filling us with his Holy Spirit. God is doing his part. What do we do? I want to give you three quick strategies. Strategy number one to face temptation resolutely is watch and avoid. To watch means simply that we pay attention, that we open our eyes, that we look around. I finished 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 for you just a moment ago. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 begins, be sober-minded, be watchful. Understand who Satan is and what's happening, so be sober-minded, be watchful. What does it mean to be watchful? It means simply be awake, have your eyes open, look around you at what's actually happening. Look around you and see that you are being bombarded with temptation. Understand what the temptation is. Understand where you're weak and where temptation can lodge. Understand what what the enemy is trying to do to your life. That's the first part, be watchful. But then the second part is avoid. 
In place after place, the Bible says, when you understand that you are under attack from temptation, what you are to do is flee, run, get away from it. Because the more we leave ourselves in the presence of temptation, the stronger that temptation becomes. Watch and avoid is strategy number one. Strategy number two is pray and specifically confess. Prayer is to be a way of life for us as disciples of Jesus. Because in prayer, we come into God's presence. We seek God's blessing. We're filled with God's spirit. We're filled with God's very person and with strength. Prayer is to be a way of life for us. And there is a specific kind of prayer, the prayer of confession, that should be important to us as we battle temptation. We confess the ways that we have fallen, and we confess the ways that we are tempted to God. And in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, we read that if we confess our sins, he, that is God, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We confess our sin to God, he forgives us, he cleanses us, and as we are cleansed through confession, then we become less vulnerable to temptation in the future. Pray and confess. Strategy number three is to fast. To fast is to give up food for a period of time or to give up something for a period of time in order to seek God's favor and God's blessing and God's encouragement and understanding from God. We say no to food and to ourselves in order that we might say yes to God. And learning how to say no to ourselves is critically important as we face temptation. Because you see, we're not good at saying no to ourselves. And the essence of giving in to temptation is saying yes to ourselves, to that which we want to do. Temptation makes us think we want to do something. We say yes to ourselves and fasting teaches us how to say no to ourselves. And when we learn how to say no to ourselves, we learn how to say no to temptation. There's work that we do in standing against temptation. God helps us, and there is work God wants us to do. Christian did have to fight the demon Apollyon. Apollyon began his attack by shooting flaming arrows at Christian. Christian had a shield in his hand, and he raised the shield, and he was able to stop the flaming arrows Apollyon was casting at him. The battle was pitched, and it lasted four hours, and Christian was wounded repeatedly in the battle. Sensing an opportunity, Apollyon finally sprung on Christian. He wrestled him, he wrestled him ultimately to the ground and it looked like Apollyon was about to take Christian's life and Christian recognized that he had a sword and he took the sword in his hand and he thrust it into the side of Apollyon. Wounded, Apollyon recoiled in pain and fled, never to be seen again. And it sounds like great fantasy writing. It'd make a wonderful movie. But it's good theology too. Of course it's good theology. Because a demon attacked with flaming arrows and the shield that Christian raised was of course, from Ephesians chapter six, the shield of faith. And when it was time for him to finally defeat Apollyon, the sword that he reached for is none other than, of course, the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, the Bible, the truth. And what we find is that, of course, Christian defeated this demon with the weapons that God has given to all of us, faith, the Bible, the Word of God, and truth. And we remember God has given us all the help we need to resist temptation. So let's face temptation resolutely with Jesus. Temptation happens to us all. It happens to you, to me, 
It happened to Jesus. Temptation is powerful, but temptation is not sin. When we face temptation, there's always a choice. We get to decide. And Jesus helps. And he's the one with authority. He's the one who has defeated Satan and evil and temptation. And with Jesus, we can stand.